Hello, I'm the Grub Street Vlogger, and uh, June's been a bit of a funny month, as you shall see as we go along. But, to start off with, I read uh, Penelope Fitzgerald, A Life, by Hermione Lee. Now, Penelope Fitzgerald, I finished the last of her novels, uh, I didn't read them in order, but I finished the last one of her novels in January or February, um, and then I was done, and there was no more Penelope Fitzgerald. Except for her non-fiction, which, yeah, I'll dig up and I'll read. But I've always been fascinated, really, as, as soon as I read her, um, about three, four years ago. How did she do what she did? Her novels are these very peculiar, um, small, finely cut diamonds of things. I was like, oh, I want to find out how she did it. And I want to find out a bit more about her life. I knew a few things that she started her novel career, at the age of 60, and then she finished at 80. Uh, I knew that she taught, and I knew that some of the, the first four novels, the things that happened to her, like she had worked in the BBC during the war, and she had worked in a bookshop um, in the middle of nowhere that, you know, wasn't, <laughs> didn't go so well. And I knew that she had lived in a riverboat, and that she came in as a teacher once and said, I'm, I'm sorry I'm late, my house has sunk. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted more, and... Look at this beast. I mean, you, you get more. Um, Hermione Lee has turned over every stone. She has gone everywhere. Not only does she have the letters and their diaries, but she even goes for diaries of children that, that um, Penelope Fitzgerald taught so that you get impressions of her from the point of view of her students. Right? She goes everywhere. She interviews everybody, anybody you could think of. Uh, you learn so much about her. And that's when I realised that I didn't really want to know all that much about her, or that she wasn't uh, quite... I didn't find her as interesting as I was expecting to. So this is a really good biography. It's probably the very best biography you could get about Penelope Fitzgerald. I don't think it could ever be bettered. But it turned out I didn't really... Oops, dropped... I didn't really want to know so much about Penelope Fitzgerald. I think part of it is that she was born uh, to a very rich family, uh, yeah, all bishops and things, and that they were all very exceptional, and that she grew up expecting to be exceptional, and then life got in the way, and then she came out sort of as a novelist and, and fulfilled that. Uh, it <coughs> <coughs> More about that later. And uh, fulfilled that um, exception. Uh, and as such, I I didn't get on with Penelope Fitzgerald that much. And the more I found out how she wrote her books, like she was a you know, very fierce editor and all this kind of thing, it was great, but it took some of the mystery out of the books. And I kind of finished the biography almost wishing I hadn't and that I'd been left with my own ideas of this... Um, sort of otherworldly wizard of, of writing. Uh, and the book gave me a full human. It turned out I didn't want her to be a full human. So it's a great book, but I didn't particularly enjoy it. Um, so there you go. Now the next book was Virginia Woolf, The Waves. I need to stop going. Sorry about that. In um, the month beforehand, for June, whatever that's called, May, I read um, To the Lighthouse, which I was very nervous about because I expected Virginia Woolf to be quite difficult to read and dense and intellectual and not very warm or humane, but I found it really warm and humane and wonderful and I really loved the characters. This I found better. This uh, came after To the Lighthouse and is in many ways more experimental. It's about five friends. And so you have this sort of framing story, which is, and I'm doing this because it's it's the sun rising and setting is the framing story. And we get little moments of that and that reflects their lives. So you get the sun rising and then you get them as children and then a bit higher them as teenagers, uh, as students, uh, young adults, middle-aged and then old. And you get not their internal monologues. It's very peculiar. They each essentially soliloquise, and, but it, it's reported. So the way you would think something in your head is not the way it's described. It's almost like 
the Virginia Woolf has taken what was in the head and then reported on it. It's a very odd kind of book. And you know you're going to each different character because it says something like, uh, the wall was big, said Adam. Uh, and then it goes off. And almost always, the wall was big part, followed by said Adam. They never said that. It's not something they said. Or if it is something they said, it wouldn't be the way they said would say it. So that's a bit peculiar, and it's a bit strange. But once you get into it, you get these five characters, and you get how they construct their personalities over time. And so you get sort of the bases of their personalities and how they build on it and how they interpret it and how they question it and how they question how that affects the world. And then as they get older how they kind of become solidified by it, maybe even in a straitjacket by this personality they've developed, and then how, and they get much older, they kind of let go of it or run on autopilot, depending on who they are. And so you get these really detailed, interesting uh, lives of each of these five friends who are, who um, they're friends from early childhood and they come together at various points, though Weirdly, it the, it doesn't trace them by when they come together. They only come together two or three times. It's a bit odd on that. And one of the great things about when they come together, when they're alone, the soliloquies are longer. And when they come together, they're shorter and they, they almost respond to each other. And you, you get this sense of them as a unit, them as friends sort of spread out across the country. Or, you know, they, they might not be near each other for years and years and years, but they're still connected. And it was it was really good. And it made you think about friendship, and it made you think about your own personality, you know, what it's built from, how you've consciously built it at some points, how uh, things just have accumulated, how you, how you, sometimes you get stuck by your own um, ways of seeing the world, uh, and then of course because it's five different ways of seeing the world, you get all these contrasts. It's a wonderful book, and it was very moving, and I loved it. I'm really a big fan of Virginia Woolf. I, surprises me. The third book was called Mr. Fortune's Maggot. And it's by Sylvia Townsend Warner. Now, I know her as T.H. White's biographer. And uh, I don't know if she is his li literary executor. I don't even know if she's alive now. But that was kind of how I knew the name. But she had also been a novelist. And I thought, ah, pick that up. Have a read of it. Now, a maggot is a weird idea. So Mr. Fortune has a weird idea. He's a banker, and he decides to go and be a missionary. And so he does. But when he's there, he's like, oh, I don't really like being a missionary of all these other missionaries. I want to go be a missionary by myself on a little island. I want to go do it properly. So he does, and he goes to a fictional island called Fauna, and he in the South Pacific. And he makes a convert on the very first day, who is a young boy. And, and there's a relationship forming there. And you think, this is a book from 1927. Are they going to go there? And it sort of does. Like, he he loves this boy in, in the sense of, like, human you know, friendship and loving. But he's also quite turned on by this boy. And this boy seems to to, to reciprocate in some ways. There's, uh, there's no sex. But there's a lot of oiling. A lot of uh, massage. Um... And, and then there's this huge uh, firework, <laughs> there's this huge volcano. And it, don't do that, you need to stop that. And in this volcano, the, um, the, the young boy, his personal god is destroyed because all the people on the islands have a carved god of their own. And so he's lost his god because he wasn't really a convert to Christianity, he just liked the man. But the man also loses his God. And it's how you look at the two of these people and they've both lost their God. And the boy is distraught. And the man doesn't really care. And he realises, oh, I don't really think I believed in God. Or if I did believe in God, there wasn't a God to believe in. And now I don't believe in God. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not missing anything. And he, he doesn't really know what to do. And he's got this boy and this boy's distraught. And he thinks, all right, I'll, I'll give him something. And so he tries to teach him... Uh, Maths, which seems the most un cruel thing to do to me, but there you go, and it doesn't work. And he comes to the realization that he, being from a sort of a colonial country, from a colonial culture, can't see anything he loves without trying to add to it or change it or improve it. 
And in doing so, he's a harm. And so he's a harm to this boy and he's a harm to these people. So he goes away. And that's the end of the book. <laughs> and it was a very interesting book. Like, the, the issues were interesting. It was very simply written. Uh, he was this kind of plain man who who is confronted by all these unusual things and doesn't really know what to do. And it was it was very good. But it did end very suddenly. And I really wanted to get back to my next book. Another Virginia Woolf. I read Mrs. Dalloway. And this is the book I was reading when I caught COVID. Uh, I told you I'd get back to that cough. So uh, I'd read most of it. I felt a bit weird. And I, I'd gone to get my second jab. And I thought, oh, I've got a bit of a cold coming on. But I've had a few colds during this COVID time. And they were colds, you know. I read the things. It was dry, continuous cough, change of smell, temperature. No, I no, just got... A yeah, bit of phlegm, fine. Uh, and then the next day, I got the, the jab on Saturday, the next day on Sunday, I felt really quite awful. And I thought, well, maybe it's the after effects of the jab. I mean, actually, my first jab didn't have any after effects, but maybe this one, I'm feeling you know, a bit of that. And then the next day, I still felt bad. I thought, oh, I better go get one of these lateral flow tests, because you can get, I can walk in and get one on the way to work. I'll go do that. And, uh, give me the morning off. And it came back positive. Uh, and what was really weird, I then had to take a PCR test. And that was in a totally different bit of London. And I had to walk to it. So I spent my first day uh, with a positive COVID um, diagnosis, walking around about eight miles of London, getting all these tests, which uh, I didn't get the tra transport, I think. But it seems a strange system. And then, yeah, I'm just... It's locked in here. Uh, I had five days of uh, fever and aches. Uh, every joint ached. Every joint. Like, I know these ones, you know, knuckles, and I know those ones, but those ones, I never thought about those joints. But even they ached. Uh, and I'd wake up in the morning, and in the morning, I'd have slightly a bit more energy and, and, and ability to ignore the aches and so in the mornings I could read a little bit before it came down on top of me and that was how I finished Mrs Dalloway uh, in snatches uh, with fever and aches so I didn't get everything out of it I could have <laughs> but I did very much enjoy it uh, it was a much simpler book than the others I'd read it it, it's, it was written earlier uh, it's about Mrs Dalloway and she's getting ready for a party. And as she's doing so, she's thinking about the the two other people she could have married and kind of the other lives she could have left, led. So she went for the, the stolid, sensible, slightly dull man. Uh, there was the exciting, fiery man. And then there was the woman. And she could have gone with any of those three and, and led these different lives. And she's thinking about you know, what it could have been and about the circumstances. And at the same time, we go into other people's heads, different friends. And then we also go into the head of a guy called Septimus. And Septimus, who has uh, come back from the war, First World War, and his possible lover has been killed, and he's been struck by the fact that he hasn't felt anything. His, his emotions are dead. And as a result of this, it starts to drive him uh, mad. Yeah, it gets PTSD. And then his emotions start spiking and, and lowering very, very rapidly. And at times he's he's filled with this sort of rapturous joy. Oh, the world's lovely. The leaves are talking to me. Everything's great. You can solve all the world's problems. The leaves have told it to me. It's love. It's love. And then other times he's right down. Everything's terrible. Everything's terrible. And his poor wife uh, is watching her husband disappear. Who she doesn't even know that well. They've only really just married, and they. Yeah, they've been taking him to the GP and the GP's just gone, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing. It's not a real illness. You just need to sort yourself out, go for a walk. And so they've been taking him now to a Harley Street specialist because the whole book takes place in the day. So that day they take him to the Harley Street specialist who is this cold, creepy man who who forces everyone into orthodoxy. And, and he says, right, you're going to have to come to my, my place in the country and you know, not talk to anyone and just relax for a bit. 
and and feeling these forces of orthodoxy coming to squash whatever it is he is he actually jumps out of a window and impales himself on some railings so that's going on as well as mrs dalloway going and buying her flowers for her party and then it all comes together at the end of the party uh when the the, the suicide man septimus is one of the topics and so the party's the bit i read with covid uh and i still managed to really enjoy it because you've met a lot of the characters who are going to the party already and you've been in their heads a little bit and you get to know them a bit so now at the party you get to see how they are together and you get to see Mrs. Dalloway in her element. And she's a wonderful mixer. She's very good at going and solving little disputes and introducing people to each other. And if there's someone over in the corner who seems a bit lost and alone, you bring them in here. And she's really, really good at it. And so this party happens. And then the party fizzles out. And then the novel fizzles out. Um, and it fizzles out just before she's about to meet, not meet, but see again who she hasn't seen, the two figures she could have gone with. So in some ways, her story doesn't have that ending or at least doesn't have that climax but at the same time again humane really good characters really um in depth looking at how they are i mean i find all virginia wolf characters think about death suicide uh, and uh, their central personalities a lot more than say i do i mean i don't walk about when i'm walking down the street thinking oh i'm going to die one day or oh, what is the nature of my personality <laughs> Uh, maybe she did, which is why she did go and kill herself. But um, still, uh, yeah, there was a warmth and a humanity, and that was great. And uh, it, it at least took me out myself for some of those uh, horrible COVID mornings. Now, the next book I read is a weird book that I read at a weird time. It was by Beryl Bainbridge, and it's called Young Adolf. And it's about 16 year old Adolf Hitler coming in on a false passport uh, to see his brother in Liverpool. And uh, his uh, brother's wife did a memoir where she said about how Adolf Hitler did visit them uh, just after the, uh, no, just before the First World War. Uh, now, in terms of my timeline when I read this, it was on the last day of the aches and pains. So they, they, they were less, but constant. And I read this in one day, to distract myself from them, really, because uh, I don't find films all that distracting. I get very distracted from films and uh, music I like to listen to, but nothing works like a book for me. And so it did its job. <laughs> it distracted me from the aches and pains, and I enjoyed the book. But then when I thought about the book, I'm, I don't think this is great, to be honest. One, I didn't see the point. So you've got young 16 year old Adolf Hitler but it doesn't really look at him and try and work out why he became what he became uh, mainly it was look at this 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 person oh aren't they an idiot aren't they foolish aren't they um feckless uh don't they fall over a lot and and, and we can laugh because that person's gonna be Adolf Hitler <laughs> Hitler fell in a puddle <laughs> and uh, that doesn't it didn't quite do it for me. Also, he's not the most unpleasant Hitler in the book. His brother's horrible. Uh, and then also, also, he's come to Liverpool and he's got sort of embroiled in this um, thing. He, he himself thinks that people with beards are following him. And it turns out they are because there's a man with a beard. who is It's complicated. Uh, and, and he's got involved in this other guy who has all these secret things going on and thinks, oh, maybe it's like a secret revolution, but it isn't really. It's just trying to keep the um, the council officials away from taking children from mothers, which actually fails. And so you've got Hitler in the middle of this, who, you know, isn't the most normal of human beings, but he seems so much more normal than every Liverpudlian in this book, you know, who who do all kinds of weird things for no discernible reason and, and all this sort of abrupt violence. Um, in fact, when he leaves Liverpool, he's glad to get out of the madhouse. So, yeah, and, and that reminded me a bit of an awfully big adventure where a lot of the characters, I didn't really follow their motivations. Maybe I just don't understand Liverpudlians. But, yeah, that was that book. Then the next book was again by Bell Bainbridge and was Master Georgie. 
Now, again, in my personal timeline, the, the aches and pains period was followed by the nausea, uh, foggy mind, confusion period, which was about three or four days where I just couldn't focus on anything, where I was a little bit confused, a bit befuddled, uh, everything was swirly, I felt kind of sick. It was, um, you know when you wake up and you're still a bit drunk, it felt a bit like that. I just I couldn't I didn't read for a while. Um, I read I think I read the first chapter and then couldn't continue for several days. And then when I did, I really liked this book. <laughs> so uh, Master Georgie is a, um, a surgeon who decides to go to the Crimean War, and various people in his life decide to follow him. Uh, and and then it's their experiences during the Crimean War down in the camps at Belgrade balaclava and outside Sebastopol and things like that. And you know what? The Crimean War is a brilliant um, setting for a book. I looked on Wikipedia to see if there were many other you know, uh, English novels set then and it only listed three. Now I know it's not you know, an oracle, it doesn't know everything, but I was surprised because Crimean War's got everything. It's got people dying from incompetence and blundering and, and um, you know lots of corruption and lots of private deals between people uh, that leads to hundreds of people dying. Uh, in fact, it's it's very relevant to now because the, the people at the top didn't care about the soldiers at the bottom. They were just there to be got through. And that's very much how I feel like our government has treated us during COVID. They had no... I mean, of course, they don't, they don't know who I am, but they had no interest in protecting me. If I get it, I don't get it, I live, I die, they could not give a shit. And it was very much like Crimea. It felt very, the, the, it felt really similar, just throw these people out there, just just build a wall with their bodies, it doesn't matter. Um, and also it's got these wonderful um, premonitions for the First World War. I really do think Crimea should be used uh, for novelists. I think it's a, a very Good gold mine, and she does get her few nuggets out of it. She really does. So it's a bit of an odd book in that it's written in chapters which are almost like little self-contained moments, or self-contained, you know, a day or two or an afternoon, and you have to then put the novel together out of it. It's not, it's not a smooth novel. You have to take the pieces she gives you and, and construct it, and as such, it was really, really interesting. Because of the Crimean thing mainly, the characters were decent enough. You know, why they followed Georgie, each each of the his hangers on had a different reason for doing so. And uh, and yeah, it all made sense. Unlike <laughs> the Liverpudlians in, in young adults. So yeah, and then just uh, you know the the, the uh, I've forgotten the name of the place, Val Valmy, Val Valis, the first place they camped that was full of cholera. And then they, they moved on and they didn't attack Sevastopol when they should have and you know, the Light Brigade. And although these things are almost just off the book, they all impact characters and everything like that. And it was, uh, yeah, it was really, really interesting. It made me watch some documentaries about the Crimea as well. And I, I, I was very uh, entertained by it once I could get myself together to read it. Now, the next book I read was My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfei. Moshfei? Uh, yeah. I read it because the title made me laugh. <laughs> That's It made me laugh because I'd had 10 days of not rest and relaxation and then was thrown back to work where I was expected to pull double duty because there were people off with COVID. Uh, and I really was not ready for it. And so I wanted rest and relaxation. And I thought it was a amusing thing that maybe I had had it by being sick and uh, horrid. And it's it's about a woman who is empty, completely empty. She has no connection with anybody around her. She has no connection with the world around her. She's not even an egotist. She doesn't even have a proper connection with herself. She's just a blank. And she doesn't know what to do with her life, so she decides, oh, I'll, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll go and get as many medical uh, sleeping aids as possible, and I'll hole up in my myself, and I'll take 
these drugs and I'll sleep. Then I'll wake up a bit and I'll have a bit of food. Uh, I'm sure my friend will come and annoy me at some point. Um, and I will watch old Whoopi Goldberg films. And then I'll take some more drugs and sleep. And that way I can spend an entire year hibernating. And that's her plan. That's how I do a good life. And, you know, it's not a nice book. It's a woozy, druggy, sleepy, nightmare book. It reflected very much how I felt myself. Uh, I didn't take any drugs with the, you know, the COVID or anything, but just this sort of weariness really did speak to me. It reminded me a lot, actually, of my third year of uni, uh, the summer of my third year of uni, when all my friends had gone back to their respective homes. But I decided to hole up in, in, in where I was at uni and um, write essentially the three years worth of essays that I hadn't written yet. So it's 40,000 words of essays and I buggered up my sleep schedule and I couldn't sleep for two, three days at a time. And so I'd write these essays and I'd sit and watch like uh, Michael Keaton Batman films and things like that. And, and it reminded me of that. Uh, with the exception that I, 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 you know, I didn't choose that really. I just fell into it because I was an idiot. <laughs> but it's, it's not a nice book, but it really does capture that, that malaise, that weariness of life. Um, people have said they don't like it because the main character is dislikable. Well, she's not even dislikable. She's just nothing. And then she comes out, and we're given some token element that maybe she has moved on and maybe she will develop, but I don't think so. Yeah, it was it was good, and I liked reading it, but it was not nice or fun or anything. And then the last book I read in June uh, was called God's Behaving Badly. And I read it because, oh, it's by Marie Phillips. And I read it because I wanted a bit of fluff, really. I just wanted something nice and funny and... Uh, entertaining. It's about gods who are living in modern day London, Greek gods, the Greek pantheon. It turns out they're the only gods that really existed. Uh, they're really annoyed about Christianity because they know it's not true, but everyone's believing in it. And they, they make do of what they can. And I really love the first few pages in which Artemis has gone for a run on Hampstead Heath and she's seen a tree. And she's like, oh, this tree shouldn't be there. So she says, hello, tree. And the tree's like, hello. It's like, oh. You haven't met my brother, have you? You know, blonde, beautiful. And you're like, yeah, I did. And then, I don't know, since then, I have I feel like I'm a tree. She's just like, yeah, you are a tree. Oh, I mean, you're a nice tree. You have lovely variegated leaves. Well, that's good. Um, But I can't do anything about it. <laughs> and it's how blase the tree is. The tree's like, oh, well, you know, if I'm a tree now, it's fine. I thought, oh, that's funny. I like that. The next scene was then Apollo and Aphrodite having uh, disappointing sex in a dirty toilet. And, uh, you know, it reminds you that they're niece and nephew. And that was kind of it for the rest of it. It was very... They had this premise which you could have had a lot of fun with. And it, it went the easy way. Like, the gods all had hilarious uh, modern-day... Uh, jobs based on their powers so Artemis was a dog walker Aphrodite was a phone sex worker and Dionysus guess what <laughs> he runs a nightclub and I was like ah, easy jokes there were a couple of jokes that seemed a bit more uh, clever or interesting for example Eros has converted to Christianity even though he knows it's not true he likes the messages and a lot of reviews I, I saw the books and I was like what why do you include that? And I think it's because in Piccadilly there's that statue of Eros. But when they built it, it was supposed to be the angel of Christian charity. So I think it's a reference to that, maybe. Um, and there was some good stuff about the underworld. They go down into the underworld at one point, and a modern-day underworld. And everything's created from imagination. So all the suburbs are the same mock Tudor house. It essentially it looks like Stanmore. Just, just to say, not shoot a house everywhere because once they've imagined it, once they can duplicate it. But the palace in which Hades lives in has a gravel driveway, which is an unimaginable luxury because each of the pebbles in the gravel driveway need to be imagined. And so there were a few clever bits, but for the most part, it just went for the, the easy. And the story wasn't all that, and the characters were were flat and and yeah, you know, as you kind of think they would be because the Greek gods they have their thing. You know, you can't change them too much, so they're going to be flat. 
but the the writing was very simple. Uh, the, there was a lot of he where two people are talking and it starts to attribute the dialogue each time, and you think oh, I don't need that because there's two people in this room. I know who's talking to who, and you know if their voices were distinct enough, I I wouldn't hardly need he said he said she said anyway. So it's, it's yeah, it was a, a rather flat. Um, Go uh, an interesting premise, and so yeah, that was my that was my June. Um, some great books, uh, mostly by Virginia Woolf. Uh, I did like the Year of Rest and Relaxation, even if it it wasn't pleasant. Um, and I did like Mister Fortune's Manga as well. Though I don't think that will be one that sticks with me very much. It was a good month really for reading. Um, it was just a bit of a shoddy one uh, overall. Next month is July. Uh, I'm pretty much at work all month. We'll see what it is.